This film is concerned with the causes of fatal accidents in the field of general aviation. There are two primary factors involved, the man and the machine. First, the airplane. A licensed manufacturer produces it. A licensed A&E mechanic maintains guard. Of fatal accidents, 5% can be traced to the power plant, airframe, equipment accessories, or to the inadequate maintenance of the airplane. This is 5% of the fatal accident total. The second primary factor is the pilot. He is physically fit by law. He is mentally capable. He is responsible for a probable 85% of the total fatal airplane accidents. The remaining 10% of primary causes of fatal airplane accidents are undetermined and miscellaneous. We have then 10% undetermined, 5% attributed to the airplane, and 85% whose cause is the pilot. This is the situation we face. It is the concern of every pilot, of this man, of you, of all of us. For it is upon us and our judgment that the responsibility lies. It is for each of us, individually, to consider ourselves and our ability to make a flight decision. We must examine our strong points and our weak ones. Our personal characteristics so often affect our decisions. In this pilot can be found one of the most dangerous personal characteristics an airman can have, false pride. He is afraid other people will recognize his limitations. They might, but a realistic attitude is necessary to good judgment. Exhibitionism is a dangerous personal characteristic when affecting the decisions of a pilot. It is easily recognized by fellow pilots. For the show-off himself, it may be difficult to coldly recognize his desire for attention and how badly it is affecting his judgment. There are among us those who rebel against the rules refusing to recognize they are a matter of common sense. Such a man is the VFR pilot who flies above a cloud deck without ground references, trusting blindly in Lady Luck. The desire to take shortcuts is based on impatience. It is a dangerous personal characteristic. The temptation may be to skip part of the cockpit procedure, to skip or not to skip. The growth of good judgment or of bad judgment depends upon just such decisions. If a man is lazy, it will affect his decisions. Something will be ignored or forgotten, or he will decide it's unimportant. This VFR pilot substitutes an autopilot and other special equipment and experience. Overconfident, he constantly practices poor judgment. The pilot landing this airplane lacks the ability to make up his mind. He is undecided here whether to make a wheel or stall landing. An indecisive person is out of place as a pilot. It is a difficult characteristic to overcome. Let's consider the narcotic drug, ethyl alcohol, which is in all alcoholic beverages. It affects the central nervous system, slowing down reaction, perception, and coordination. The bloodstream carries it to all parts of the body, including the brain, and the effects are always subtractive. Alcohol is a depressant on the nervous system. It reduces a person's skill and his ability to make objective decisions. The only safe rule for clearing the bloodstream of alcohol is the 24-hour rule strictly adhered to by airline pilots. This pilot should ground himself today, but here he is with weather building up, his skill and judgment impaired. 
Indiscriminate drinking is an extremely hazardous characteristic in a pilot. In analyzing the pilot as a cause of fatal airplane accidents, there is another element to consider. Let's call this the stimulus, meaning the circumstances surrounding the pilot at the moment of decision. He may be troubled by financial problems. He may be in a hurry. He may be in doubt about this flight, but decide to risk it. If so, he made the wrong flight decision. We must remember, any decision made in regard to the use of an aircraft is a flight decision. So we know when making our decisions, we must first guard against our personal characteristics and second, guard against the stimulus of the moment. One of the most frequent causes of fatal airplane accidents is the decision of VFR pilots to continue flying under actual instrument conditions. Why they make this decision is known only to them. A pilot's decisions are his alone. This pilot we will call pilot number one. He plans a flight from Chicago, Illinois to Atlanta, Georgia. The aviation forecast for his route is increasing cloudiness, but continued favorable visibility for aircraft operating under VFR, or visual flight regulations. South of Louisville, the ceiling is unlimited. A frontal system moving out of the southwest is scheduled to reach Chicago in approximately two hours. From current available information, he can expect the weather to improve the farther south he travels. He was told that a squall line could develop ahead of the cold front. The flyer of this plane, pilot number one, is a non-professional pilot untrained in instrument flying techniques. Two hundred miles to the east in Toledo, Ohio, another pilot, pilot number two, plans a flight to Louisville, Kentucky. He too considers the frontal system moving north-northeast. He has been notified of the possibility of a squall line developing ahead of the front. From the available forecast information, he logically decides he can beat the front to Louisville by at least two or perhaps three hours. Pilot number two is also a non-professional pilot, untrained in instrument flying techniques. Pilot number one, en route from Chicago to Atlanta, encounters light rain squalls north of Indianapolis. He maintains fair visibility and can see the horizon. The weather picture suddenly changes. At Louisville, it is raining. At Indianapolis, the Weather Bureau uses a special telephone with direct wire to Indianapolis radio. It is advised that a squall line is building across the area. The ceiling is dropped and visibility is becoming restricted. Weather Bureau stations along the line notify CAA stations and they in turn contact the aircraft on flight plans. Pilot number two is notified that a squall line is building in the area. He is approaching a squall with flying conditions below visual flight regulations. He knows positively only one other thing, he can land. This is the moment of decision. He sees a hole up ahead and decides to go over the top. The decision is his alone, as for his reasons, we can only speculate. Pilot number one also receives the current weather information. To his right, he sees the horizon. Ahead, he has poor visibility all the way to the ground. To his left, visibility is also restricted. Now to his right, squalls are beginning to develop. From what he sees, and from the weather information on his radio, he too makes a decision. He will notify Louisville radio he is turning back and is putting down at Evansville. This pilot, untrained as he is in instrument flying, has somehow learned the sharp difference between visual flying and instrument flying. He knows that in instrument flying, all reference points for controlling the airplane 
are inside the airplane. And he knows he is incapable of flying by the use of inside reference points only. He realizes his limitations and has excellent pilot judgment. A look at the weather map will show what happened in this area. Indianapolis, overcast with thunderstorms. Evansville, overcast with thunderstorms during past hour, but not at time of observation. Lexington, broken clouds with towering cumulus developing. A squall line developed 180 miles ahead of the cold front. The low reached Chicago, and now unexpected thunderstorms are developing along the squall line 200 miles ahead of the front. Under such a frontal situation, which is not uncommon, the ceiling can change a thousand feet within seconds. Holes disappear very rapidly. Pilot number one taxis to a tie down at Evansville. He sees he is just squeezed in ahead of the storm. Pilot number two is on top of the storm. He has been pushed up higher and higher. He is now at 13,000 feet with clouds pushing still higher. He is looking for a hole to go down through. He believes he is 50 to 100 miles south of Louisville. He is fighting a feeling of panic. Panic is real and becomes a dangerous factor to be recognized and dealt with by the pilot. With a feeling of desperation because of time and gas and altitude, he makes his decision to go down. In turning, he picks up ice on the windshield. Within seconds, he is flying in instrument conditions. His years of visual flight experience are worthless. He has at the utmost eight minutes the average is three, until his airplane is in a dangerous attitude. Within this time, the airplane turns, the airspeed increases, vertigo grips the pilot. His efforts to correct compound the danger. With an awful, logical precision, the airplane begins its spiral. So 85% of the fatal airplane accidents are due to the pilot, to his judgment, the decisions he makes. We can't know why he makes them. We can realize there is something potential in all of us. We can work for good judgment. We can make the flight decision the right decision. We can turn back, land, and fly another day.